I'm Professor Lori Hodrick, the founding director of the Program for Financial Studies, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the third annual Program for Financial Studies conference. Today, we faculty members, students, alumni, and practitioners gather together for a discussion about navigating the changing landscape of finance. The program agenda proceeds as follows. We begin with our keynote address by James Gorman, followed by two concurrent panels. Panel one will discuss asset management and will be held in 555 Learner. Panel two will discuss corporate finance and will be held in the Satow Room, also on the fifth floor. Information about the panelists is available in your program and your name tag indicates which panel you have selected. There will be volunteers wearing blue ribbons on their name tags who stand ready to assist you as you head to your next location after the keynote address is finished. After the panels, current Columbia Business School student attendees will join panelists and members of the advisory board of the Program for Financial Studies for a luncheon in the Broadway room on the second floor. Let me gratefully acknowledge Morgan Stanley for their sponsorship of the student luncheon. And let me acknowledge BNP Paribas for their sponsorship of this morning's delicious breakfast. Both panels, as well as the keynote address, are being videotaped and will be posted on our website. So if you're interested in experiencing the other panel as well, or if you'd like to share the experiences today with others, you'll be able to access all of the videos online. It is my great pleasure this morning to now introduce our keynote speaker, James Gorman, a 1987 graduate of Columbia Business School and a member of the school's Board of Overseers. Mr. Gorman became CEO of Morgan Stanley in January 2010 and chairman in January 2012. He previously served as co-president of Morgan Stanley and has also served as co-head of corporate strategy. He joined Morgan Stanley in 2006 as President and Chief Operating Officer of the Global Wealth Management Group. Before joining Morgan Stanley, Mr. Gorman held a succession of executive positions at Merrill Lynch, including leading the company's US and subsequently global private client businesses, and also serving as head of strategy and research. Prior to Merrill Lynch, Mr. Gorman was a senior partner of McKinsey & Company, where he was a member of the firm's financial services practice. Earlier in his career, Mr. Gorman was an attorney in Melbourne, Australia. In addition to serving on the Board of Overseers of Columbia Business School, Mr. Gorman serves on the Federal Advisory Council to the U.S. Federal Reserve Board, the Monetary Authority of Singapore International Advisory Panel, the Business Council, the Financial Services Forum, and the Boards of the Partnership for New York City and Institute of International Finance. He formally co-chaired the Business Committee of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and served on the board and as chairman of the Securities Industry and Financial Market Associations in Washington, D.C. Our conference today explores the pressing challenges of navigating the changing landscape of finance. Within the financial sector, we have witnessed global consolidation, followed by the 2008 crisis. The debate is ongoing about which factors determine an institution's ability to withstand such crisis. Today, it is our tremendous privilege to share Mr. Gorman's insights on this important question as he discusses the role and responsibility of systemically important financial institutions in a global economy. It is my great honor to introduce James Gorman. Morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Hodrick, for very kind uh, welcoming comments. And um, I've got to shorten that resume because sometimes it feels like I can't keep a job. Uh, it's like a bouncing ball. Um, by the way, uh, happy uh, post-Halloween, everybody. I hope you got appropriately dressed up as you went about the streets of uh, Manhattan last night. Um, I talked to my wife and I said, I think I'll go out as a Wall Street CEO. She said, I'm not so sure I would do that if I were you. <laughs> So it was, uh, it was a lot of fun to see all the kids outside. We have a, um, a wide-ranging topic to cover here, um, and I'm not sure I'll do it justice in my remarks about uh, 30 minutes. But uh, as a result, we therefore have some uh, question and answer time uh, for anything you want to follow up on. Obviously, the financial industry 
uh, has been through its largest change in this country and around the world in probably 70 or 80 years. Uh, Morgan Stanley was founded after the Great Depression uh, 76 years ago. And uh, it was as a result of the splitting of investment banking from commercial banking. And that really was the last major crisis of, of true size. So um, it's, it's a, I'm very honored to have a seat at the table in seeing the next uh, crisis. And as Rahm Emanuel, uh, former chief of staff for President Obama, uh, commented, you never want to let a good crisis go to waste. And uh, it's important that institutions like Columbia Business School, and I commend Dean Hubbard for uh, this program and this initiative and taking this kind of leadership. Uh, it's very important that institutions like Columbia Business School inside this great university take that kind of leadership in trying to understand what happened, what we can do about it. Are banks really bad? Um, or are there more fundamental questions going on? So this is the beginning of a discussion that will play out over several years, I'm sure, and hopefully I'll make a small contribution uh, this morning. Um, to do that, I'm, I'm going to cover uh, rapidly a quick look back of, in about three or four lines, what I think happened five years ago. Um, trying to identify a culprit, because there's no good story without a culprit. Um, talk a little, very briefly, about the regulatory, political, legislative response, uh, which is obviously ongoing. Um, how the banking sectors, and the SIFI banks in particular, um, responded. Uh, they, they, of course, are the, or the GSIFIs, the Global Systemically Important Financial Institutions, I think is the, is the um, exact title. And um, in this country, it's essentially the largest banks that you would expect. Uh, then how Morgan Stanley has responded, and is it enough? And then at the end of it, we're going to launch a new initiative at Morgan Stanley um, that we're doing in cooperation, collaboration with uh, Columbia Business School, uh, which I wanted to share with you. So all of that we're going to try and get done in about 28 minutes because I've already used up about seven. Um, so here goes. So what, what, uh, let's look back and understand what happened. My simplistic um, description of it is that banks' balance sheets were over-levered with illiquid, risky assets. So you start with that. Um, as time went by and it became apparent some of those assets were both risky and therefore problematic and illiquid and therefore difficult to sell at anything close to fair value, uh, the b banks uh, started taking losses and losses to their capital and their capital base was already pretty thin because in most cases they were operating with leverage of about 30 times. So that means if you write off 3% of your balance sheet, you write off 100% of your capital. So it didn't take the investors and creditors to very long to figure out that if you have very over-levered balance sheets and the stuff that you're over-levering it with is illiquid and it's not, shall we say, capital robust in a stressful time, then it's not hard to imagine you're actually just running out of capital and going out of business. And for a financial institution, uh, the most important thing is, of course, confidence. Because every institution, even the unlevered institutions, are levered 10 times, which means they can only be wrong 10%. So that confluence of losses to capital, which were already very over-leveraged institutions, created a crisis of confidence. And that really is the essence of what happened in the financial crisis. There was a crisis of confidence. Um, when there's a crisis of confidence, it's like you've all seen the Jimmy Stewart film, It's a Wonderful Life. Mrs. Jones wants some money. The teller's trying to explain, unfortunately, it's been lent out to Mr. Brown and it's in his house. That's how he got to buy a house. And we don't actually have the money here. We're a conduit. Banks are conduits. They're not, they don't hold the stuff there, 100% liquidity. So when there's a crisis of confidence and everybody wants their money, well, it's not all there. And that's a problem. And that then feeds more crisis of confidence, and then you start the good old-fashioned run on the bank. Um, because at the end of the day, liquidity is what it's all about in the financial sector. Once you've had a run on one bank, everybody stops looking at that bank. They immediately say, well, how good's the next guy? And I described it a little bit like the planes coming to land at Newark Airport, which I used to be able to see from when I was on the other side of our building. You could see all the planes coming in down from upstate New York 
through to Newark and there, there was the one about to land at 1,000 feet, there was another at 5,000 feet, probably five miles back, and another at 15,000 feet, five miles back. And the first plane was Bear Stearns. And uh, they sort of hit the tarmac and, you know, but the rescue crews were there and they scrapped them up pretty quickly and packaged them off and they shunted them off to a, a very wealthy hangar over there in the corner and cleaned them up. The next one to come in was Lehman. They didn't do so well, they just crashed. And the next one to come in was Merrill Lynch and they sort of did okay, but they got a little help landing and then they got moved out of the scene and had their wings stripped off them and, and so on. But eventually it was everybody. And for anybody to say that this crisis didn't affect them was a fundamental lack of understanding of what a liquidity crisis is. It affects everybody, it affects the whole system and ultimately the full faith and confidence in the US financial system and, and everything that we stand for, which is why the government acted as they did to step in and try and put a finger in the dike and stop this thing. And we can all argue whether it was done right, whether they should have done it with Bear or with Lehman, whether they should have uh, taken different actions, but they did stop it. So you have to give them credit, and I think, um, and I've said it publicly many times, what Treasury Secretary Paulson and uh, Chairman uh, Bernanke and uh, head of the New York Fed Green, uh, Geithner did, I thought was uh, very courageous. So that's what happened. We had a run on the banks, it was escalated, the government stepped in and stopped it. In the meantime, there were forced mergers, there were outright failures, there were restructurings and there were recapitalizations. And all of that has taken place over five years, both here in Europe um, and in the UK. Um, it did not happen, interestingly, in other very heavily banked markets with very large banks. And I won't go into all the whys and wherefores, but it gets at a root question of, was it because our banks were too big? And it wasn't because our banks were too big. Actually, the smallest of the biggest institutions were the ones who got into trouble. So that's what I think happened. So what's the culprit? Is size the culprit? It's interesting, somebody gave me a sheet last night that said that uh, the eighth largest balance sheet of banks in the world currently is uh, JP Morgan, and it's the only one in the top 10. Um, I think ICBC, I assume it's ICBC is number one, um, and you sort of go through the list. So we're, we're actually, and we actually have, because of historical reasons, one of the most fragmented banking systems in the world. We still have 7,000 banks. Now, yes, the vast majority of them are small, tiny, um, but we have a very diverse uh, banking system. Where I grew up in Australia, it's essentially four banks have over 85, 90% of deposits in the country. No bank here has more than 10%. Um, Canada's the same, Japan's the same, Switzerland's more so, France is the same, um, and you can go around the world. So the US actually, ironically, despite all the rhetoric in the press, has the most um, diverse financial system and dispersed financial system. So it's not size. Um, in fact, it was the big banks that the government went to to help bail out these troubled ones make them bigger. Was it complexity? Yes and no. Uh, the no is being a large complex institution does not of itself render it unmanageable as evidenced by many great banks globally that did not get into trouble during the financial crisis and in this country. Um, JP Morgan and Wells Fargo are good examples of very large complex institutions that did just fine. In fact they were seen as saviors. Um, the no part is I think there are a lot of institutions that had not properly grown up, and particularly the Wall Street partnerships, that operated as private partnerships where their capital was their money, suddenly became public companies, um, with I think uh, DLJ might have been the first one to go public, uh, then Merrill Lynch and all the way through our institution and the others. They became public companies, but they didn't necessarily behave or put in place um, the gates that you would if you were a true public company. So they were still adopting many of the partnership model, but in a public company spectrum with much, much, much larger balance sheets and not their own capital at risk, somebody else's capital. Um, so in some ways, the Wall Street fraternity had not grown up quickly enough with the size of their institutions and ability to manage it and their risk processes and so on. Um, third possible culprit is management. I, I believe management is a culprit uh, in most of these instances, why did some institutions fail and not others? Why, you know, why, it's like, a, you know, God went around and picked randomly. Well, it wasn't totally random, it was because in many cases, management did stupid things. Either they had um, 
levered a particular type of asset in very heavy concentration, or they had decided to aggressively expand uh, by buying institutions they were not, uh, frankly, hadn't done their diligence on. A good example was the Wachovia acquisition of Golden State. Golden State had about $120 billion of option arm mortgages. And those mortgages, uh, or pick and pay as they're sometimes called, um, were things that uh, if you took a, you know, 20 point mark on them, you had a $24 billion capital hit. And they did an acquisition because they wanted to be a national bank. What do you do to be national in this country? You have to be in California. What's left in California? What's left in California is Golden State. They buy Golden State. And all of a sudden you're marking down these option arm portfolios and it wipes out the whole capital base of Wachovia. That's a management decision. They didn't have to do that. And so you can go through each of these of, you know, were there opportunities for some of the failed institutions to act preemptively to sell off assets, maybe not at the optimal price that they wanted, but at a price that would have saved them? Absolutely they were, and they didn't do it. So, um, you know, don't underestimate the ability of management to really screw things up. And when you're playing with financial institutions, that, that really matters. Um, so there are a lot of, um, uh, you know, contributing factors. There's no single culprit. The essence of it is that if you have very high leverage on very thin capital bases and very little liquidity, then if any shock hits the system, you've got a problem. And the smaller and more concentrated you are, the bigger the problem you've got, and that's exactly what happened. So what has been the uh, regulatory and political and legislative response? Well, a lot of people complain nobody's gone to jail for these particular activities, and as um, saw from my resume, I have the fortune, good or bad, of being a former lawyer, and last time I checked to go to jail, you have to commit a crime. It's not good enough just to be wrong, or to be incompetent, or to have made mistakes, or to have taken on too much risk, you have to commit a crime. So there's a reason inside trading people are going to jail, and, and executives who oversaw institutions that didn't do well aren't going to jail. Um, and I can't speak for the whole industry, obviously, but you've, you've got to you know, the, the, our system works for a very good reason, that we have a good legal system, we should honour that. That said, um, clearly the regulatory fines, penalties, punitive, uh, all the class action lawsuits are the other way of finding the culprit and causing the financial institutions to help pay back to society uh, what they feel is, uh, was their wrong. On the regulatory side, I think of it as two bookends with a um, continuum in the middle. Bookend number one is, if I'm a regulator, I say, okay, if capital, liquidity, and leverage were, were too small, or leverage's position too large, let's set some rules to stop that from happening again. So if your capital ratios were 5%, they're now 10%. If your leverage was 30 times, it's now 15 times. If your liquidity was 5% of your balance sheet, it's now 20% of your balance sheet whatever set of rules, but move the dials on all of those. And that has happened very aggressively. You think about it. If you're earning the same amount of money and you double the capital, your ROE just dropped by 50%. Everybody says the bank's ROEs aren't very high. Well, they're not very high, not necessarily because they're not earning money, but because they're also carrying masses amounts of capital. So the regulators have put in place a set of uh, walls, if you will, or protectors at the front end. At the back end, they say, well, let's assume that it doesn't work and we get this wrong and we have to unwind an institution or put it in a bankruptcy or resolve it by selling off pieces. Do we have a process for doing that? Do we know what all the legal entities are globally? How do we run that very complicated set of legal entities through a machine that helps us sell them off, unwind them, effectively put them in a bankruptcy? Because with Lehman Brothers, of course, there was a great problem, particularly in the UK, with trapped capital trap balance sheet. So that regulatory response at the back end is now being crystallized in the form of a resolution plan for the bank, banks, where we walk into, and it's co-authored by the FDIC um, and the Bank of England with the Federal Reserve, and we walk into uh, those institutions, we say, if those gates you put up the front don't work and the bad stuff is happening, here's how you resolve these institutions, and this is how you resolve a Morgan Stanley. So the government and the regulators have a plan. That's the back end. In the meantime, to ensure that we never hit that, we get an annual report card, which is called the CCAR process. 
where the Federal Reserve requires all the banks, big banks, to put their balance sheet and their businesses through a big washing machine, stress test at a level that is worse than the financial crisis we had, and see if you survive at the end of it in a theoretical set of scenario planning. And the survival rate is considered 5% minimum capital and various other leverage ratios. So it's those three things. The front end, just some blunt instruments. You've got to carry more capital, carry more liquidity, carry less leverage. The back end, if God forbid this thing doesn't work, there's a way to unwind you. And the middle of, we never want that to happen, so let's have an annual report card on how you're doing and give you a score. And that score then dictates, can you do buybacks, can you do acquisitions, can you do dividends or not? Or maybe you have to go and raise more capital. And that model is now starting to be rolled out uh, globally. So the response is, I don't think it's well understood just how robust this response has been from our regulators. And in my opinion, um, obviously I have views on different parts of the regulation, but in aggregate, a robust response was obviously necessary. We can't have another financial crisis of the magnitude that we had. It caused the country to go into a recession, it caused a lot of people to lose their jobs, it caused a lot of people to lose their homes, it caused a lot of pain and hardship. From the taxpayer perspective, in the simplest, which is the TARP, the money given to help banks capitalize effectively until they could go out and actually raise capital, um, what is not well understood is that $700 billion did not go to the banks. 260 or 70 billion dollars went to the banks. The rest went to insurance company and automobile manufacturers and so on. Um, the big banks paid back TARP as they should. That was their responsibility. They paid it back and they gave, uh, through warrants and, and uh, interest uh, payments, returns to, in that case, the shareholders, you and me, the taxpayers, approaching, in our case, 21%. And that's good. Taxpayers deserved a sporty return for underwriting a big risk. And I think that's just great, but we should acknowledge that and celebrate the fact the money was paid back. The smallest hundred something banks still owe about $2.7 billion a tarp and that's yet to be paid back. The big banks actually have paid back the money and they should have. They should have paid it back quickly and they did. So stepping back for a minute um, to Morgan Stanley, how did we respond? We responded, frankly, not unlike the regulatory response. We like to think that we did some of these things before our regulators told us to do them uh, because we were sufficiently um, uh, introspective or self-aware that we knew we had to make changes and we didn't need somebody to tell us that. So we went out and raised a lot of capital. We um, have two uh, very large investors, uh, CIC, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of China, um, and Mitsubishi Bank, or MUFG, which now owns 22% of Morgan Stanley in a unique global partnership. So we've created stability uh, at the front end. Our, our liquidity at the time of the crisis was about $80 billion on a balance sheet of 1.25 trillion. It's now about $180 billion on a balance sheet of 800 billion. Our leverage at the time was 35 times and it's now about 12. Our capital was 30 billion, it's now 62 and so on and so on. So we've put up a lot of strong barriers at the front because I can assure you, we don't wanna go through this again. And we just completed our resolution plan to the regulators, and I'm sure we'll get some feedback if it's robust or not, but it's thousands of pages and a lot of uh, folks uh, working on it, so I'm pretty confident it is. And we've come through this annual checkup, this CCAR process, and in fact came through well enough in the last year where we were able to do two things. One is commence a buyback program, which we did very modestly, um, and secondly, complete an acquisition of a wealth management business that we've been contriving to buy through a complicated deal with Citigroup over the last four or five years, and we did that last year. So we're now one of the world's largest wealth managers, which gives us ballast and stability. We shut all our proprietary trading positions, so we just serve our clients with our institutional securities, and that's the combination. So a lot of safety guards at the back, <coughs> solid plan in the God for Big category, past programs through the CCAR for four years in a row, and now redesign the business model to make us safer. Um, and it's been a journey, let me just say that. Uh, a lot of very, very complicated and difficult decisions in a four-year period. And as I, I like to say, I was a, a strategy consultant to financial institutions for um, most of my professional life. And I think I, we probably got more strategy done in two years than 
I saw those institutions do over two decades in aggregate. So uh, making strategic choices, thinking about them and talking about them is one thing, but actually having to do it and suffer the consequences and be second-guessed by most people out there is another experience altogether. So it's kind of nice to see when it all, um, it all plays out. But the most important thing is not about Morgan Stanley, it's that the system in the US, I believe, is safe and sound. And it's a credit to the institutions, it's a credit to the regulators, um, and it is reality. It's not something everybody wants to hear. A lot of folks want to continue to believe that somehow the banking system is in trouble. That's not true. It's certainly not true in this country. And I'm not talking about profitability, I'm talking about soundness. Um, so I'm sure there'll be some questions and answers on that. One of the gnawing issues, which um, uh, I'd like to now transition to, is why is it that the world doesn't think that? And this is difficult. Um, you know, in my rule in advertising is that if the world doesn't think highly of you, the more you advertise to them, the more you irritate them. So, you know, if there's been a problem with some car manufacturer or tire manufacturer and a lot of accidents from that and suddenly you're going out running all these glossy ads about what great tires you've got, people have exactly the reverse reaction. So the industry has been beleaguered in its ability and handicapped in its inability to put out a forceful response. And at times when that response has been put out, it's seen as defensive or dismissive or the regulators don't get it or whatever it might be, as distinct from, no, actually, the industry really matters. You can't take capital out of capitalism. You know, you need banks to match issuers and investors. You need banks to match savers and borrowers. The, the society can't go back to a barter system here. And God forbid you try and finance, you know, geez, I'm not sure what their debt issuance is a year, the tens of billions of dollars with a bunch of small banks. It's not going to happen. And selfishly, for this country, this has been one of the industries where we have, if not dominated, been very, very conspicuous in our success. And why we would want to cede that to other nations just because we want to be smaller makes no sense to me. There is no compelling argument that our institutions are too big. In fact, the reverse. The concentration of the banks in this country doesn't approach the concentration of almost every other country in the world. That's an inconvenient truth, as Al Gore would say. But it happens to be true. And the size of our banks in absolute size doesn't approach the size of the banks around the world. I'm going to Australia next week. The four biggest banks in Australia are enormous. It's got a population of 20 million people. It's got an economy as big as New Jersey and half of Pennsylvania. It's got four monster banks sitting down there and they're very well run and they do a very good job. So somehow we need to get the balance back into what the banking system is doing for society. And you wouldn't have, you know, we had Twitter in our office the other day at the launch of their, uh, along with some other banks, at the launch of their uh, IPO roadshow. Um, you wouldn't have these companies being able to access the capital markets. In fact, most of the developing countries around the world are trying to build robust capital markets, robust debt trading capability, so that their companies can source international monies to then go and grow. So banks are very important. It's a good business. It creates enormous employment in this country. We alone employ 56,000 people, the vast majority in the US, and we're tiny compared to the biggest banks who are employing 200 plus thousand people. They throw off a lot of tax dollars which help build our communities, pay for our police forces and everything else. So somewhere we've got to stop and find this right balance between banks need to be safe and sound. That is, that is a line that cannot be crossed and we never want to go through the crisis again. But banks also need to be able to function well to do what they do to cause the rest of society and our businesses to grow in the way they need to grow. One of the things that we've tried to do is shift part of our focus as an institution to what we call sustainable investing. And you don't need many more facts than this one, that the population in 1950 on this planet was 2.5 billion, it's currently over 7 billion, and in 2050 it's going to be projected to be nearly 10 billion. So you've got a lot of hungry, consumer-oriented people out there that we didn't have 50 years ago. 
and our resources are the thing that is going to sustain us. And finding renewable resources, managing our resources intelligently, and ensuring that this population growth and all the new classes coming through are properly given the opportunities to have the kind of lifestyle that the rest of us have enjoyed is part of what banks can play a role in. So we have, for the last couple of years, under the leadership of Audrey Choi here in the front row, has done just a spectacular job for us, uh, really made a focus on trying to provide a series of sustainability, so-called sustainability initiatives for investors and issuers and communities, and have included um, intermediating $40 billion of clean technology financings uh, since 2006. Uh, we've done 1,175 long-term public financings, totaling $145 billion. These things can't be done by community banks. And that's not to say community banks don't do a great job. They do do a great job for their communities. We do a great job for sovereigns, for major corporations, and for individuals investing around the world. You need both for the system to work effectively. Morgan Stanley's made community development loans and investments totaling nearly $8 billion. It's created 38,000 affordable housing units and 47,000 construction jobs through that. That's a great thing. We're proud of that. But it's also a necessary thing for our economy to, to be working the way it needs to work. So this morning, I want to announce another initiative building off of that with the creation of the Morgan Stanley Institute for Sustainable Investing. And the goals of this institution are to take the momentum which we've had here and crystallize it uh, with a broader partnership, doing this uh, here with our partners at Columbia Business School and with the board of directors from around the world who will oversee our efforts. We preside over $1.8 trillion of investors' money in our system. A lot of those investors are saying to us, we want to invest in things that we think are sustainable, that contribute to the well-being of the resources around this planet. We currently have about $2 billion, and we're setting a goal of $10 billion of client assets under what we're calling Morgan Stanley's Investing with Impact program in the next five years. So we're going to match investors' desires, which a lot of foundations, not-for-profits, I'm sure school endowments are already doing, but a lot of individual investments' desires to participate in investing in a way that they think is appropriate for the planet that they're inhabiting. The second, as part of doing that, we need to create product. We have a lot of intellectual capital across our institution, and we can create products which are interesting and generate reasonable returns for risk-adjusted return for our investors, and we're doing that with our investment management, long-only and alternative investment platforms. The third thing is, with partnership here at Columbia Business School, we're creating a fellowship program, and we're going to select, and we hope it will be three to five students a year, uh, who will do internships with us, working in this space. We will pay for them, provide the jobs, they'll do the internships, and hopefully through that we're contributing in a small way of growing a cadre of leaders for the future who really understand financing on a sustainable basis. And those individuals will work in our banking, they'll work in wealth management, they'll work in our alternative investment programs, they'll work in our capital markets businesses, and they'll work in our trading businesses. And we'll see, and I'd love to see that program develop more as the years go forward, because I truly believe this is where we need to move as an institution. And finally, we, in collaboration with partners, are going to be investing a billion dollars in sustainable community initiatives, where we're going to be working to improve the quality of housing in a lot of communities uh, around this country. And our two partners in this include, and I think they're both here, uh, the Local Initiative Support Corporation and NCB Capital Impact on sustainable community investments. So it's those combination of matching investors with products that are innovative, bringing talent and leadership who understand this space and can contribute to it at Morgan Stanley, and hopefully as they come back to Columbia Business School and then as they go through their careers, hopefully some of them at Morgan Stanley, and working proactively in our communities and using our muscle in the marketplace where we touch you know, three million households in this country. We have 800 locations in this country, and we are managing over $1.8 trillion of individuals' wealth on behalf of um, individuals, foundations, not-for-profits. We think there's a huge market for this, and we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Um, so with that, I want to uh, thank you for your time. Uh, this is a journey from the crisis that will last uh, many, many years, and if all of us chip away rather than looking for one big solution, 
but chip away how to make the system safer and sounder and at the same time make the banking industry more relevant to what society needs, I think we will have achieved a lot. Thank you for your time. We're now going to take questions from the audience. So if you have a question, um, there's a microphone. So if you'll stand up. But first, um, on behalf of everyone, I know you join me in thanking Mr. Gorman uh, for his remarks. Mr. Gorman, thank you for coming today, and, and that's a very exciting initiative. And um, I've got to say, as, as an investor and an investor in financial institutions, um, on a relative value basis, I think yours is, is uh, you know, uh, very, very attractive relative to your peers. And I think one of the things uh, that you guys did quite differently coming out of the crisis and in the short term paid a price for was scaling back your <clears throat> proprietary and risky businesses. And you didn't mention that in your talk as um, one of the issues, but the concept of housing every risk under one umbrella uh, is a concept I think that still persists with, with uh, many institutions today. And I just wonder if you could comment on you know, your strategy to scale it back, whether that was regulatory driven in terms of getting in front of it or whether it really was a business model uh, decision. Well. Thank you, Patrick, and to the um, uh, comment about us representing good value, as the um, actor in House of Cards would say, you might say that, but I couldn't possibly. Um, but um, maybe you haven't seen House of Cards, but I, I, commend, I commend particularly the British version to you, um, Ian Richardson. Anyway, I digress. Um, no, it was, it was an explicit business model decision. Now. Um, it was both a positive and a defensive act. The positive act was that as we look at what has caused Morgan Stanley to thrive for 76 years and has been you know, one of the leading one, two or three investment banks in this country pretty much the whole of that time, that doesn't happen by accident. And as we were, really took a look at ourselves, it's because we were always considered a very client-centered institution with very high intellectual capital. Smart people working on complicated problems that was somebody else's problem, our clients. So we reverted back to that model. During the boom years of um, you know, the mid-2000s, when particularly the fixed income businesses were making so much money, they're making a lot of money largely because they're making a lot of principal bets, if you will, or position taking. Um, a, we think that that space is diminished, obviously, from those go-go years. And the defensive reason is we weren't so good at it, you know, if we're blunt. We, we strayed from our core DNA of what we're good at. We tried to do what other people are good at, and we weren't so good at it. So we uh, had a hedge fund which we uh, shut. We had a stat statistical arbitrage business which we spun off. We had another small startup business which we converted to a client trading business. Um, we shut down a number of prop trading desks across our mortgage area. So it was a very deliberate strategy. It happened to coincide with what the Volcker rule is, and I had the pleasure of having um, lunch with one of our directors here, Mr. Volcker, a couple of days ago. And um, you know, conceptually, I understand and agree with it, but my view of that was we didn't need to be told to do it. We were going to do it anyway, because why would shareholders want an institution like us to put our capital at risk just to per perpetuate gains for ourselves and not do it on behalf of our clients. It was a disconnect. If they want to do that, they should go to a hedge fund. There are plenty of them and they're really good. So that's not why I felt people were buying the stock and it turned out we weren't that good at it and it turned out it strayed from our core. So it was that combination of things that got us there. Question at the microphone. Th th this mic is on too. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jim, I, I have a broader question, not just, I, I think it applies a little less to Maureen Stanley because you, you're not a retail deposit taker and so forth, but I, th I think it gets to the issue, you know, when, when the institutions are all highly leveraged, including Maureen Stanley, 
as an investor in those institutions, I always said, well, why isn't the return on equity higher? Because so it sort of suggested either that the underlying business really wasn't that profitable. Another issue maybe was compensation uh, was part of the uh, impairment to profitability to the shareholder. But I, I read something about Bank of America the other day which was interesting, and that, that is that their retail deposit customers, that 90% of them, in effect, they lose money. And now they're going after only a premium, you know, they're really trying to target their premium customers, the 10% for additional services. But there's so much objection to, for the small customer paying the true cost of the service with fees, which, which as I'm sure you're aware from a public relations point of view. But it seems to me that the politicians to some extent have created an environment where everybody expects somehow financial services are supposed to be provided for free, which is not a very capitalistic idea. But I just wonder your comment sort of more on the macro situation with respect to the profitability of, of financial institutions and the need really for the public to pay the true cost. Well, Firstly, just a, a, um, a, a fact which you may not be aware of, we actually are a very large retail bank now. We're the 10th largest in the country. Um, by combining our wealth management business with the business we bought, uh, Smith Barney, we, we will have, when it's fully transferred over by the middle of year after next, $130 billion of deposits, which make us number 10 in the country, which is very exciting because we can provide appropriate loan products to our clients who are otherwise borrowing from other institutions, we'd be perfectly happy for them to do all their business with us. Um, on the, um, the industry actually was very profitable during those labor times. If you look at the ROEs, they were, they were consistently uh, sort of 15 to 20% for the large banks. Um, and now if you saw the latest quarter's results, um, there were only uh, three institutions of the large global banks, investment banks, that generated ROEs above 5% out of three out of probably nine or 10, uh, which is remarkable. Happily, we were one of them, not meaningfully above it, but that, that's a sign of what happens. When you double capital, you cut your returns in half. So let's say the average return was 18%. It's now become nine overnight. Then you add the liquidity charge to that, which brings it down to eight or seven. And then you reduce your leverage by two thirds, you bring it down to four or 3%. Now you better go and figure out something to do with your business model to find parts of it that are less capital intensive and to take the most capital intensive parts and be very deliberate about which pieces you'll feed and which pieces you'll starve. So that's the, the sort of macro of where the industry is. As to what the politicians are doing, I, I think that there's a, um, a sense that a lot of banking services have become um, so uh, utility oriented that they can be conducted on mobile devices and so on and, and should be a lot cheaper and that's understandable. They're obviously being delivered without all the bricks and mortar and the branches necessary. Um, but I, I think consumers are willing to pay for services they think create value. And you know, if, if you look at, I'll give you a practical example, if you look at the wealth management businesses in this country, if you aggregate all the fees, the prices, the spreads, the commissions, all that stuff together across millions of accounts, which we do, um, the average client is paying about 80 basis points, less than 1%. So if I said to you, you could go to one of the top institutions in the world, you can access product of a wide variety, um, you can have full, a, a full world-class service provider working with you, talking on the phone, moving your money around, uh, providing interesting products for you, giving you performance reports, annual statements, for less than 1%, you'd say I'll do it. Interestingly though, I'll send, you know, I send you a 30 month, $30 a month fee for a UGMA account, you say I won't take that. Right, so that, that's, you know, there's the sort of consumer rejection of fee pricing, but the aggregate um, payment by consumers I don't think is, is unreasonably high and hasn't frankly changed very much for about 30 years. Please join me, oh, Professor Glassman, do I see a question? You, you mentioned that you recently completed your uh, resolution plans. I'm curious about your views on the status of uh, resolution authority. Do you think it's the FDIC has the ability to resolve a large complex financial institution without major disruption to the economy? Well, at first, I give the FDIC great credit. They've taken to this task with um, 
uh, extraordinary vigor and worked very well with the Bank of England. And uh, I think the, the, you know, the, the uh, adjudication will be that the plans are really pretty robust. And I know the Federal Reserve, all the regulators, the OCC, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, the SEC, it's like an alphabet soup, but they're all, um, uh, they're all actively involved in resolution. Uh, yes, we believe that it does make practical sense in the way that the plans are put together. The one thing you can't control for is what is the environment that you're operating in. So selling off pieces of an institution in a market where there are no buyers obviously creates a different dynamic. So as best as uh, the plans can anticipate future events, I, at least in our case, I, can, I haven't obviously read anybody else's, I think they're very robust and give a much better roadmap than what we had, which was none going into the last crisis. Will they be able to withstand all shocks and types remains to be tested in the marketplace. But at the moment, um, I think both management of institutions and regulators are, um, again, I don't want to speak for others, but I would say we are uh, more pleased with the result and the outcome and more comfortable with where we are than we thought we'd be going into it. If you'll now please join me in thanking James Gorman for his comments.